Good morning, happy Friday. Welcome inside the River's Edge Studios at Mr. Small's Theater in Millvale, PA. I am Matt Geica, and you are listening to Geica's Got Game. We've got an assortment of unsolved mysteries for you over the next hour or so. Are the Vegas Golden Knights the favorite in their first ever season making it to the Stanley Cup Final? Are they the favorites to win this whole thing, if I can put it a little more clearly? I think they might be, and I'll get into that in just a second or two. Also, baseball's home run surge, it's a well-covered phenomenon by now. It's been going on for nearly three years. And as scientists and physicists dug into it, they've figured out that we really have no idea what is causing this. It's not a launch angle. It's not any of that stuff. It's a complete mystery in that way. So I'll explain further also later in today's program. And... If you want to talk about an indecipherable problem, the Pittsburgh Pirates of 2018 are one of those, at least for me. The players that I thought would carry them to contention, if they were to contend this year, haven't really done that much. It's been other players. It's been unpredictable things that have uh, that have led to their 27-22 and 22 record. Yes, I know they've lost, what, five out of six as they return home for a, a homestand here against the Cardinals and the Cubs. Looks pretty significant. Looks like an early turning point. But still, for me, how they're over 500 right now, if you look at some of the players that haven't performed, it doesn't all add up, at least in terms of where I was uh, thinking that the production was going to come from and, and who might be more in the background. In a lot of ways, that's been reversed. I am Matt Geica. I am a co-owner at Pittsburgh Hockey Now. I am a contributor to PiratesProspects.com. I am the play-by-play voice of the Pittsburgh Riverhounds, and I am also a talk host here at the River's Edge for the past nearly three years. I got it started in July of 2015, so coming up on that anniversary and over the past year or so, right up here on top of the hill on Evergreen Street in Millvale from this historic and traditional media uh, outlet that is Mr. Smallest Theater. At least it has been for my generation. I know previous to this, it was a place of worship. Now people come to listen to a different kind of music. It's no longer on the church organ, and uh, it was part of the festivities for the Millvale Music Festival a couple of years ago. That's in the rear view, but we are still here at the River's Edge, this radio station, promoters of local music in addition to local talk. So go to riversedgepgh.com for more information on what we do and what we are all about. This is a sports talk show, as you might imagine from my teaser here, but It's not your typical sports talk, or at least I try to keep it away from the easy and the reductive analysis that you might hear on various commercial stations, not pointing any fingers here in this market or others, but I haven't really liked what I've heard from sports talk radio, and I'm guessing that many of you out there are similarly frustrated with that, so I try to add some nuance, I try to be measured in my analysis here, and I try to also go off the board and and bring into play things that you might not often hear talked about on Sports Talk Radio. But I have a feeling that across this great nation of ours on this Memorial Day weekend, many people like myself who are yakking on sports are yakking about the Vegas Golden Knights. Yes, you've heard it many times over. I just talked about it on my 200-foot podcast on Pittsburgh Hockey Now last night, posted on the website, cheap plug. But the Vegas Golden Knights are the story of the decade in sports for me, at least in North American pro sports. And if you want to talk surprises, yes, Leicester City of the English Premier League, that's soccer for those of you who don't know, they were maybe more of an upset, but I don't know if it was more than this, more than seeing the Knights in their first ever season, excuse me, making it to the final. And to be clear, they haven't climbed the mountaintop just yet, but to get to this point, to defeat all comers in the Western Conference and to arrive at this stage, the biggest stage of the sport, very, very rare indeed. In fact, it's unprecedented in North American professional sports. And we can go into the whys and the hows, but I arrive at this point, why pick against them at this stage of it? And If we can avoid the cliche about Vegas and being the odds-on favorite, I don't think they're the odds-on favorite. I think, excuse me, I think that phrase gets misused, but I think they're the slight favorite to defeat the uh, the Washington Capitals in this Stanley Cup final. If only by looking at 
the results they've gotten. They just dispatched who I believe to be the best team in hockey, the Winnipeg Jets, in five games. They weren't blowouts by any means. The only blowout really was uh, when the Knights got spanked in game one of the West Final. But to get through and to get more rest, the Golden Knights have had extended rest periods after each of their first three playoff series this year. That gives them an advantage, in my opinion. Also, their goaltender is playing better than any other goaltender on the planet. You might know him. His name is Marc-Andre Fleury. He plied his trade here in Pittsburgh for 13 seasons. I don't think he's ever played better than this. And I'm not sure there's a team out there that is deeper up front than the Vegas Knights. They may not have that top-of-the-line star power. William Carlson scored 40 goals, so perhaps I'm wrong on that. Maybe I'm going off of perceptions from prior to the season, but... Bear with me on this one. I think it's a lot of second to third line caliber players. And maybe that's the way to go in the NHL these days. Maybe the gap between the top of the line guys and the middle of the road guys has shrunk, as some analysts have said on social media and other platforms in recent weeks, as we've all collectively in hockey tried to figure out what in the world is going on that has allowed an expansion team to get to this point. And we can concede that The Knights had advantages in the expansion draft that previous expansion teams didn't. 15 years ago, the Atlanta Thrashers or the Minnesota Wild or the Columbus Blue Jackets or the Nashville Predators, they all didn't have the ability to build as quickly as George McPhee and the Golden Knights did this time around. But none of us, or at least very few of us, thought that the Knights would even come close to making the playoffs this year. I was thinking around 70 points. I was thinking maybe in a couple of years they could be good. I actually thought McPhee screwed up the expansion draft. I thought he should have played more for this year because, in my mind, the rewards of being good in your first year, while the Oakland Raiders still haven't moved to Vegas, while that market is still all yours, would be more so than when you have to share it with other teams or other entities. And who knows, maybe the NBA shows up in Las Vegas at some point. I always thought it'd be the NBA first into Vegas, not the NHL. The NHL, in fact, seemed the the league, maybe, eh, maybe slightly ahead of, of Major League Baseball in that way. But uh, the NHL seemed the league most stuck in the mud with regards to being afraid to go into Vegas because of all the gambling connotations and, and the challenges there. But instead, they took a risk, and I always thought it was a great risk. I applauded that. I didn't think this team would be this good right at the start, but these fans have certainly bought into it, and, uh, well, there's no reason to think that uh, it's going away anytime soon. The Knights hysteria. I have family who live out in Las Vegas, and they have bought in completely. They may have cheered for the Penguins in the past because they have Pittsburgh roots, but no more, or at least the the Penguins are a distant second. And uh, with where the Knights are and uh, with what they've done in this first year, It goes against any kind of convention on expansion teams. But for me, it's good for the business to to see this team succeed. Good for their business and good for the NHL as well. Because if you're trying to sell expansion teams and your chance to come in and compete, I don't think you can sell it any better than saying, look at this team. Look what they've done. I don't know if Seattle's going to have exactly all those advantages. And I'm not sure the GMs of the NHL are going to give up quite as much as some of these GMs did to McPhee and Vegas. But... If you are Seattle and you're a future Seattle NHL fan and they're about to be awarded a franchise officially here next month, you've got to love it too. So there are many of us who feel like Vegas doesn't deserve it. The fans haven't been long-suffering. All right, I understand that. I get that side of it. And if you're a Washington Capitals fan, I know you're saying there's no way that Vegas should win this series. We've been waiting for nearly 50 years for a crack at this. And the Caps still haven't even won a Stanley Cup final game. They've been to one 20 years ago against the juggernaut Red Wings, and they were swept in four games. So I think they'll win at least one. But for me, I have a hard time picking against Las Vegas at this stage of it. And if I had to go back, what, six months, and and I heard myself in the future saying these words, I would think I was on drugs of some sort, or I was in some sort of a fever dream scenario. How has this happened? I guess we can spend all summer debating that. I wrote a few things down on Pittsburgh Hockey Now earlier this week on what I think the Penguins could learn from this, but is it replicable? I don't know if it is. This could be a -a once-in-a-lifetime situation. We have never seen this in the modern era of North American pro sports. Yes, the St. Louis Blues did make the cup final, before you get on me there, in 1968, But that was because all six of the NHL's expansion teams from that year were in one division. So someone had to make it. They made it out. They got wiped out. 
And um, ever since then, we have not seen anything close to uh, to this sort of a scenario where an expansion team was plopped in to a division, to a conference with all these other established teams. So with what they've done, with how they've played, and in looking at some projection models, I feel confident in saying I think the Knights are going to win the Stanley Cup. And the only question we'll have in a couple of weeks is who's going to lift the thing first? Will it be Las Vegas native Derek Englund and former Penguin? Will it be Marc-Andre Fleury? He'd be the first goalie ever to lift the cup that quickly, I believe, because goalies can't be captains by NHL rules. There is no captain established on this team. And uh, that fits with how they've spread the talent around. If there is one guy who's carried him, it is Flurry. So I think it should go to to him first if they do win it. And if it's the Capitals, hey, I've been wrong on the Capitals the last two rounds. I thought the Penguins would beat him. I thought the Lightning would beat him in this previous round. However, the Capitals, their body of work this year, it didn't impress me as much as past seasons. And if you look at the regular season, if you look at the playoffs, I'd argue the Knights had been have been more impressive so far. So, yeah, I'm picking Vegas, and I'm picking them in seven because I don't think it's necessarily a uh, a blowout here in the final series. I think it's going to be tough. Both teams are going to have uh, their utmost focus. They're going to have the utmost motivation, as there are basically no players who have ever won it um, outside of Flurry, outside of Brooks Orpic, uh, both who'd won it with the Penguins. It's, a, it's two fresh teams. It should be exciting in that way. They're going to come firing out of the gate here <laughs> uh, tomorrow night in Game 1 out at T-Mobile Arena. Uh, the roof's going to come off the joint. And the winner for me, as my colleague Dan Kingerski at Pittsburgh Hockey now wrote this week, the winner for me is, is the NHL because of the attention that comes to the NHL due to the expansion team making it, whether that be a freak show attention and people – perhaps laughing or chuckling at that and how the world, how in the world this could happen, or if it's just genuine positive interest in that and, and seeing that story blossom. And also you have the Washington market, one of the biggest market in the, markets in the country, um, starving for hockey success. Now they all get a chance to root for their team on the biggest stage of the game. So it raises the profile of the sport, which if you are a listener of this show, you realize that, that I am a big booster of the game, not just the NHL, not just juniors or college hockey, which I've worked in. I'm a booster of the sport. I think it's a fantastic sport. I think it's the best sport out there on the planet. So to see it get this level of publicity and to perhaps pull in some of those um, casual fans, I know I've talked about how that group has decreased over the years, but um, to pull in some of those is also a positive. You're listening to Geik's Got Game here on the River's Edge. I am Geik. Matt Geika is my name, and this is my program. Coming up next, the indecipherable Pittsburgh Pirates, the indecipherable home run surge in baseball. We can't figure it out. I'll do my best to try to explain exactly why we can't figure it out. That's coming up after this break. Hey there. William John III here from Wake Up on Fire Productions. I want to talk to you about Yinsfest 2018. It will be at Mr. Small's on June 30th. We love the buzz that's burning in Pittsburgh's music scene right now. And we want to put on a different type of festival. We are booking over two dozen musical performers who we don't think are receiving the media attention that we think they should. And we aren't leaving out poets, writers, artists, and local vendors to give you a real taste of the Pittsburgh underground. Yinsfest is Pittsburgh's music festival alternative hosted at Mr. Small's entire campus, including the theater, the fun house, and the brand spanking new war room. It's been exciting to watch Mr. Small's grow. It's been thrilling to witness the new talent and musicians, local businesses and writers flourish, and we want to bring it all together. Mr. Small's, June 30th, all ages. Doors are at noon, and it goes well into the evening. Make an entire day of it. They have several full bars, they have food, they have indoor and outdoor activities. What more could you want? Come discover your new favorite band before everyone else does at Yinsfest 2018, Pittsburgh's music festival alternative. Welcome back to Millvale, just up the Allegheny from downtown Pittsburgh. I am Matt Geitka, and you're listening to Geik's Got Game on the River's Edge. Thanks again to Tyler Zelenko for producing the show and Brian Crawford for um, keeping his hand on the till, always a steady hand there. And uh, I do appreciate his welcoming me into this station three years ago. It's been an enjoyable time. 
I've been on Fridays the whole time, so it's always been a, a fun start to my weekend, too, to talk sports with you guys out there. And thanks to Jared Wickerham for some interesting comments on the, <laughs> the Facebook live stream. I also got one from, uh, from a different page, so uh, I don't want to miss this one. We, we tend to share this video, this live stream on different pages across the, uh, the Internet. Jason Fornwalt says... Vegas Golden Knights, LOL, or VGK, LOL, all caps, hashtag. So Jason's pulling for the Capitals. I don't know if he's actually a Capitals fan or he just thinks Washington's going to win. Um, I don't think Washington's going to win, but like I said, it's Knights in seven, so it could easily go the other way. That's my prediction so far. And I've been wrong about the Caps back-to-back rounds, so maybe I'll be wrong for a third consecutive time. Um, you know what? Actually, I've been wrong about the Caps three straight times because I picked the Blue Jackets to beat him in the first round. Maybe I don't know uh, Jack Squat about the, the Capitals and their potential this year. They just didn't impress me this season. I thought they were on the downturn. I'm not alone in that. But that doesn't mean that they can't play their best hockey late in the season. If you looked at last year's Penguins, they weren't quite as good as the 16 Penguins, certainly. But they still got it done. They still defied the odds. And this year's Capitals have played... Uh, have played better in the postseason than previous iterations. So there you have it. If you go by that, then uh, then Washington's going to give Vegas a, a heck of a run here. Does home ice advantage mean anything? I tend to believe it doesn't in hockey. In fact, by the numbers, it means the least out of the, the five major pro sports. If you throw soccer in there, home doesn't matter that much in hockey. It's like the home team wins 52 or 53% of the time on last accounting. So... It's a toss-up in that way, and I think it's mostly a toss-up series. Let's talk some baseball, though. The Stanley Cup Final will go on. We'll discuss that again next week here. And actually, I'll bring it up with my guest, Alan Saunders, coming in. He's uh, a good man for Hockey Talk, as you've known, as you've listened to this show. He's guest-hosted, in fact, and he's made it mostly hockey a lot of times. But I have found something really interesting on the Internet this week. Major League Baseball has had a home run surge. And if you're like me, you like dingers, you like long balls, taters, round trippers, whatever you want to call them. I enjoy seeing men with bats hit baseballs very far distances. I think it's enjoyable. I think that's the the pinnacle of hitting, right, is to hit a home run. That's what you're trying to achieve. Maybe not explicitly every time up. Maybe sometimes you're just trying to put the ball in play to drive in a run. But overall, that's the ultimate success, right? And I like watching long drive competitions in golf, too. I like hitting long drives in golf, maybe more so than any other aspect of that sport. So there could be a connection there. But it's achieving your potential as a hitter. And so home runs for me are not a bad thing. And there's been so much hand-wringing lately from media, from players, from commentators, from even Rob Manfred, the uh, the MLB commissioner at times about how the ball is in play less in baseball now because pitchers are striking out hitters more and hitters are hitting more home runs. In fact, home runs are up 50 percent, 50 percent. In fact, um, over the past three years, that's a huge surge. You don't need a, a math major to or a math degree to figure that out. But because of that, there are fewer balls in play, and base running and defense doesn't come into play. And I like watching defenders do their thing in baseball. I like watching runners run around the bases. That's part of the fun of baseball, right? Especially part of the fun of being there in the park where you can look and see where the runner is, look and see where the ball is. It's all right in front of you. That's part of the thrill of it. But I don't find the decrease of balls in play to be that big of a deal for me from an entertainment standpoint because I like watching good pitchers strike out hitters if the if the pitches are outstanding if the pitchers are getting the job done and they're throwing nasty stuff up there then I don't mind seeing strikeouts I just like seeing the best in the game do what they do and I'm not too particular about the style of the game and if guys are hitting more home runs well that's fun as well like I said I enjoy that aspect of it maybe I'm a little biased because of that but I don't think it's that big of a deal that fewer balls are in play you're telling me a home run is less exciting than a single? I don't think so. At least, I don't believe it is. But um, taste aside, there have been many commentators and analysts and now, in fact, literal scientists and physicists tasked with trying to describe or explain why home runs are up to this degree. Because it is a mystery, and we like to figure out why things happen, right? I'm always in that camp. Why? Not just what, but why and how. And It seems that the general consensus has been that hitters are putting more balls in the air. They're trying to 
um, increase their launch angle. You've heard that, I'm sure, if you've watched any baseball telecasts or read anything on baseball in the last couple of years. It's the launch angle revolution. It's the fly ball revolution. Hitters are tailoring their swings to hit up on the ball, much like Ted Williams talked about back in the day, so he was well ahead of his time. But if you get that bat on plane with a descending pitch, and when a pitcher throws from a mound, the, the ball is descending naturally, you're not only more likely to hit the ball to come in contact with it. This is a very technical explanation I'm giving you here. If you're watching on the video feed, using my hands to show you exactly what I'm talking about. But not only does that increase your ability to hit the ball flush, but it increases your ability to hit the ball up in the air and in theory for extra bases and over the fence more often. But the numbers don't really back that up. There are still hitters who are ground ball hitters. There are still hitters who are struggling to do that, to cash in on that sort of thing. And the fly ball revolution doesn't account for the extra home runs hit. What does account for the extra home runs hit is that baseballs, the literal baseball, is carrying further. And it's not more springy. Uh, The seams aren't lower, but there is less drag on the ball. That's what the physicists, uh, the job done by Rob Arthur and Tim Dix, uh, in recent years, and now Alan Nathan, also a guy you might want to follow on on, uh, Twitter if you're interested in in this sort of thing, in the sport of baseball, physics and why things happen the way they do um, in our world. But the conclusion drawn is that the decreased drag on the baseballs has allowed them to fly further. So it's not hitters hitting them harder or higher. Um, It's not anything that the pitchers are doing. It's just that the fly balls that usually died at the fence or at the warning track are now carrying over the fence or in some cases carrying further (laughs) over the fence than they did in the past. But we're more concerned about why home runs are up. So it's those borderline fly balls. The guys with warning track power now more often have home run power because the baseballs themselves are carrying further. But they dissected baseballs. These uh, these scientists did in in recent weeks and months. They, They cut them up. They tried to figure out exactly why this is happening. And they couldn't figure out why this is happening. It's a complete mystery still. Much of the chagrin, I would say, of Major League Baseball and the money they spent to try to figure this out. But no one really knows why this is happening. It's so fascinating and sometimes frustrating, right? Because if you're like me, you like to be logical and and figure out why things occur, like I said. But sometimes you can't explain it. Or sometimes you have to rule all these things out. Like Thomas Edison once said, I didn't discover uh, or I didn't make a thousand mistakes on figuring out what wouldn't light up in a light bulb. I just figured out a thousand ways that wouldn't work. Well, right now we just looked at uh, a few ways that that don't work in describing why there are more home runs in baseball. Do you dig a long ball? If so, then it doesn't appear to be changing that much anytime soon. But it's also a little disconcerting, isn't it, that no one has any idea why this is happening. One of those mysteries of life, one of those mysteries of sports. (laughs) So many theories out there and... I'm guilty of this as much as many people, but sometimes we just don't know and we shouldn't try to project our preconceptions on it. Hypotheses are part of science and and part of life, but in this case, the scientific method shows us that we have no idea what's going on in this case. This is Geik's Got Game. I like to think I have some idea what's going on inside this studio for one hour from 10 to 11 each Friday morning here in Millvale, upstairs at Mr. Small's Theater. Coming up, we'll see... Um, if Alan Saunders can fill us in on some mysteries of the Pittsburgh Pirates. He and I both cover the team for PiratesProspects.com, and we'll also discuss the Stanley Cup Final again and what he thinks might happen in this wildly unpredictable NHL postseason. Keep it right here. Hi, this is Jean-Paul DeRover. Listen to me play all the instruments and make all this music live on stage during the Filter International Music Festival from May 30th to June 3rd five-day celebration fusing live music with modern technology. Check out the link on the River's Edge website for more information about the festival. And join me along with artists representing 30 cities worldwide. See you on May 30th, and thanks for listening live to original music right here on the River's Edge. And we are back. I say we because Alan Saunders joins me in studio again for the second time in three weeks. To what do we owe the pleasure? Able uh, to make it down. Yeah, I got the invite, and uh, I'm in my regular spot, so I'm feeling good about it. Oh, you you like it there? Yeah, this is it's yeah. very comfortable. I'm, I'm kind of in the corner over here. I like it. It's yeah. nice. Great studio here, by the way. Um, the River's Edge has a fantastic facility at Historic Mr. Small's Theater in Millvale, mm-hmm. and now uh, the cafe downstairs. Yes, did you see that? Yeah, we've did got a place to hang out, so that's really cool. 
Uh, it looks like coffee and booze if you want it, so you can mix it up. Have you ever mixed those two? Uh, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll just go straight from one okay. well, one yeah. pre-show, the other after show. Yes. Right? Yeah, we'll keep it to that. Yeah, I need help waking up, so yeah, I'm a big coffee fan. I'm still working on some iced coffee from this morning. The, uh, the classic. Got this one in Boston. Don't tread on me. It's a, it's a statement, really, that I try to make every morning. Uh, Tyler Zelenko is in here producing. I said we. He's been here with me the whole time. He's got his Burgettstown Blue Devils shirt on, so that's impressive. Uh, he's from out that side of the uh, of the city. Alan, you're from out east. Um, I'm from west uh, of, of the town, so we like to meet in the middle here in, in Millvale. Have you been considering how unlikely this Stanley Cup final is? Because for me, I thought the Capitals were done not done, but I thought they were done as a, as a legit entity to go to a championship round. And w- with Vegas, I didn't know what to think after they made the playoffs. It was a complete toss-up for me. But I believe Winnipeg was the best team in hockey, and <laughs> they, they won one game in the Western Conference Final. So is this matchup as big of a mystery to you as it is to me? Yeah, I, I didn't even think the Capitals were maybe the the. F- the f- maybe they were about the fourth best team in the East to me. I, yeah, I just yeah. didn't see... Uh, the kind of dominant performance that they they put on against Tampa coming at all. I didn't think that they had the depth to play this far into the postseason, especially the scoring depth that they've shown. That's really stood out to me. I think I saw they have something like 17 goal scorers this postseason. That's almost everybody. I thought their depth was what would kill them, in fact. I didn't like that fourth line and what Devontae Smith-Pelly scoring big goals, Connolly. Um, gosh, uh, chase on these guys that just they, they picked up right at the end of the offseason and, and look at them now. And they've been doing it without some guys. They lost Tom Wilson because of suspension. Nick Backstrom got hurt and yeah. seemingly didn't really miss a beat. Um, so I think that, that the depth the Capitals have shown has been really impressive. For me, Vegas is, is all about Marc Andre Fleury. I, you, you look at the matchup for the, the final here. Uh, goaltending. Braden Holtby, this postseason, 18 games, 924 save percentage. That's really good. I mean, that's like, that. that's shoe in Con Smythe good. Mm-hmm. Marc Andre Fleury, Las Vegas, 15 games, 947 save percentage. <laughs> that's 25 points better than Braden Holtby. That's insane. That's. That, First of all, I mean, I'd have to go back and look. That's probably something close to a historic figure, especially if you want to go ahead and make it era-adjusted. If you look at the league average save percentage this year compared to that, I don't think we've seen anything like the performance that Marc-Andre Fleury has put on this postseason in quite some time, if ever, uh, from a goaltending perspective. And I I think it's mostly about that. I mean, I, I hate to, like, simplify the analysis to man their goalie's been really good but when your goalie's that good you almost don't need a lot else <laughs> and they've had a, a lot of of help too they've scored well they've scored they've outperformed their uh their shot metrics all year long they've shot at an incredible rate their shooting percentage if you want to put it that way in the playoffs though I've, I've been impressed by their ability to control play more than i thought they would even against winnipeg they got um, outshot and outattempted uh, about 53% to 47% um, by Winnipeg. But scoring chances were dead even in the series. So it's not like it was all flurry. But to your point about flurry, I believe Tim Thomas had like a 941 in 2011 when the Bruins won. And that felt like incredible stuff because it was. <laughs> but at 947, it's probably going to tick down a little bit unless he shuts out the Caps through uh, a four game sweep in the final. It's hard to get much higher than that, just mathematically speaking. But yeah, that is number one in the storyline. And while I thought Flurry had a chance to be good for Vegas and, and even great at times, he's 33 years old. This is goalies can extend their primes more than skaters. But th- this isn't a time when you when you rise to your peak typically. But then again, Tim Thomas was about this age, maybe even older, in fact, when he did that for Boston. So in conclusion, goalies are weird. <laughs> goalies are weird, and yeah. goalies are important, and goalies are unpredictable. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody could have predicted Marc Andre Fleury at age 33 being not just the best goaltender of uh, not just playing the best he's ever played, but being one of the best goaltenders ever in the Stanley Cup playoffs. It, it's just it's on it's why it's an incredible story because 
he's not the only guy on the team that's done that. There are a lot of players on that team that have pretty decent track records of being middling to average that have really stepped their game up. Derek Engeland is one of them um, who's really played, I think, uh, a pretty outstanding game. Uh, not at all like what we saw him in Pittsburgh. And if you remember, that's a guy that came to the Penguins with essentially no pedigree. I mean, he came up through the ECHL. Right. I mean, the, the Penguins kind of took a, ch- a flyer on him uh, by plucking him from, I believe, uh, the Capitals minor league system. I think he was with the Hershey Bears. And it was just kind of a guy that, that the thought was, well, he's a non-prospect. He could be the number 7 defenseman and and not take playing time away from a more talented player. He's out there playing like he deserves top four ice time right now. And and that's another guy. Late in his career, you just didn't see any of that coming. And I think those are the reasons. That, yeah, you know, the, the James Neals, the Marcia Sos, those players were obviously talented. Mm-hmm. But I think the players like Fleury and like England that are having career years unexpectedly at this stage in their career, I think that's the biggest reason why Vegas has been so good. It's been a study in opportunity, right? It's always a thought experiment. Well, what would happen if this guy got 20 minutes a night or whatever? Uh, we often discuss that with players on teams that we think uh, are underappreciated and maybe should get a little bit more. Well, this is the perfect chance to, to figure it out. They got a whole season in the playoffs to do it. And Derek Englund, he was known for his fighting ability, which is rare for a defenseman. Uh, when he was in Pittsburgh, remember when they were trying to get tougher, I believe, in the middle of that Ray Shiro era. They had Aaron Asham on the team. Um, they had Derek Englund. And, and he would more often not make an impact with his fist than actually his hockey playing ability. And there was a lot of laughter when he signed that three-year contract with Calgary a couple of years ago, too. It's like Derek That's Englund. That's per year. Yes, right. That was the Bob McKenzie tweet. It was, what, $3 million, And we thought $3 million total for three years? No, it was $3 million a year with them. And now... Uh, Las Vegas native, or at least he makes his home there. It's it seems also perfect. And with Flurry, I, I thought of this after you were mentioning him, another French Canadian goalie who had an unbelievable playoff, Jean Sebastian Giguere for the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, as they were then known in 2003. They went to Game Seven against the Devils before losing in the final. He had a 9.45, so we're right there, right up against that. And that Ducks team more grinded it out. This Vegas team hasn't had to. Um, you know, win by one goal every time out either. That was more of a uh, of a grind there, and I understand why they gave the Conn Smythe to him, uh, one of the few players from a losing team or a team that didn't win the Cup to win the MVP of the playoffs. There's only a handful of them, and it's usually a goalie, so that's where Fleury is right now in that range. Five all-time, uh, four of them have been goaltenders. And, I mean, unless... I, here's the thing is that Washington has... A superstar who's more than likely going to get the vast majority of their points in the series. So, um, you know, I think it would probably be Ovechkin if they win. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the kind of performance that Flurry's put together. The kind of performance that wins you the Consmite Trophy, even if you lose. And and that's that's special. And that's really, I mean, well, I mean, Jaguar's actually kind of an, an interesting comparison because he kind of came out of nowhere. But he was a young goaltender when he did that. 25, yeah. yeah. Fleury's now 33. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> and it's unbelievable that he's done that at the same time other players have made the same kind of late se- late career uh, renaissance, if that's what you want to call it. Um, but that's what makes it a great story. That what, You know, at the end of the day, I think um, – that's what makes sports great, right? It's unpredictable. It, if what we all thought was going to happen happened all the time, <laughs> this would be pretty boring. So I, I think it's really exciting. I, I think it's awesome to see. And, hey, the Capitals are a good story, too. I don't think anybody had them in right. this final either. If it's just the Capitals against Team X, it's a great story because they haven't even gotten uh, halfway or they only got halfway to this point in the past. Now, would it be the the best story out of the 16 teams? I think maybe Penguins and Knights would have been a little bit better just because of Flurry against his old team and a team going for three consecutive championships against an expansion team. But for me, this is probably the second best possibility if you're talking about interest in the Stanley Cup final. Yeah, I think so. It's two American cities, first of all. So I think for the, as far as the league is concerned, yeah, that, they like that. That that certainly helps interest. Um, and yeah, it's it's. Two markets that have never won the Stanley Cup. Obviously, Vegas hasn't <laughs> had the opportunity, but it's it's fresh, it's new. I you know, I think when you're looking at um, from the interest standpoint of a random hockey fan somewhere in America, let's say from Boston or Michigan, you know, somebody that loves hockey, but 
are they going to tune in to watch the Stanley Cup Finals if it's you know the, the Kings or the Blackhawks and and the Penguins you know playing for their third or fourth championship in the last decade? You know that I think at some point that loses novelty. It loses the casual interest of hey, hey here's a generational superstar that's never won a championship that's going for his first, and here's an expansion team. I mean, that, it doesn't really get much better than that. <laughs> I think so too. And there are some out there who would say, well, an expansion team shouldn't be able to do this. We could argue that until we're blue in the face, whether it should happen or whether it's supposed to happen that way or whether it's good or bad. But overall, if you just take it from the interest standpoint and the novelty standpoint, it can't get much better. And in retrospect, Tampa Winnipeg would have been a tough sell in a lot of places. Yeah. Tampa's already won a cup number one. Winnipeg is still that's a hockey hipster place. You know, it's if you follow hockey, you appreciate Winnipeg, but if you're not into the sport. How many Americans could could get within <laughs> Where one <is> <laughs> within one province of pointing to Winnipeg on a map of Canada? Boy, I think a lot of folks would say it's way out west when it's really not. It's it's due north of North Dakota, Fargo. Um, you just go straight up <laughs> from there. In case you're out there wondering, and you might be, because who How among Americans us have been... could find Fargo? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, right. It's west of Minneapolis. How many people could find Minneapolis? I don't know. Well, then you get into some deeper issues with <laughs> with, with all of us here. Alan Saunders is my guest. We'll just roll through the end of the show here. In fact, you and I can kill 20 minutes like nobody's business. On from hockey to baseball. Uh, you and I both write for Pirates Prospects. Uh, you've got a story up there, a fun one on batting practice today, which I would suggest people take a look at. But for me, it's been a matter of trying to figure out why, again, another mystery of sports, right? How are the Pirates where they are? I know they've lost 5 of 6 or 6 of 7 now, uh, but they're still five games over 500. They're still within three of the division lead. How have they done it with guys like... Jamison Tyone, Josh Bell, Gregory Polanco, all underperforming expectations. Those were the guys I thought would have to step up to get them here. Instead, it's been Francisco Cervelli with a career season so far. Um, Well, Josh Harrison, when he's been healthy, has been good, but he's been out for a while. Uh, Trevor Williams stepping up to the forefront. He's a young player, but I thought he'd be a bottom-of-the-rotation guy. So it's been a a topsy-turvy season in that way for me. So how do you explain uh, how they are where they are? To me, I think the answer is depth, uh, because which you wrote about this week. Yeah. You can't have a good team without. You can't have a good team if half of your team isn't performing very well, and you struggle because of it. I think if you look at the Pirates, especially if you look at that 2016 Pirates team when Garrett Cole didn't play very well, Andrew McCutcheon didn't play very well, and Jung Ho Gong went through a long period of not playing particularly well. And the team basically fell apart. Uh, they yeah. had nothing. They had nothing there because there wasn't a lot behind those guys in terms of quality depth. And now you look at a team. Yeah, Josh Bell's not. Not. I mean, it's not been bad, but he's not performing to the level he's capable of. Gregory Polanco certainly is not performing to the level he's capable of. Same thing with Jameson Tyone, and guys like. Cervelli, Harrison, Corey Dickerson. Dickerson, um, yeah. And, and you look at the guys that have called up. I mean, Osuna's hit really well. Elias Diaz, oh, my goodness. He, I mean, any other team in any other situation, I think, would be talking about Elias Diaz. It's like, well, when are they going to inevitably trade <laughs> Cervelli? Because this young guy yeah. is just killing the ball, and, you know, he's got to get more. Where's the, you know... <laughs> Where's the cries for more playing time for Elias Diaz? Well, Cervelli's been the, one of the best players on the team, so that's where it comes from. But, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you look at the bullpen, it, it had a, a a scary first couple weeks, but I think since Crick and Rodriguez have been up, they've really stabilized things. Stephen Brault moving to the bullpen has been uh, a revelation. I think he he's pitched – uh, incredibly impressively to me uh, since he's been in the bullpen. So I think there's just a, a, look, a, look, a quantity of quality. They may not be a great team, but there's a lot of good players, and they have enough good players that they can absorb a few injuries. Joe Musgrove hasn't pitched yet. Josh Harrison was out for five weeks. Uh, Starling Marte's out right now. And on top of that, three or four guys not playing well, and they're still in a good place. I think if you look at the last maybe these last two teams, 16, 17, they both both missed the postseason. I don't think there's any way either of those teams would be in contention right now, having suffered those kind of injuries and those type of players underperforming. Austin Meadows, speaking of depth, coming up, 
He's hitting better in the majors than he did at AAA. He's talked about being able to see the spin on pitches better under major league lights. I don't know if there's anything to that. It's interesting to think about. Maybe his eyes aren't as great as some others out there. I could relate to that, having uh, worn contacts since I was in seventh grade. So uh, that's a consideration, too. But sometimes guys, and, and, and talent evaluators talk about this, too. Sometimes guys in this sport... They don't access the power until they get older, number one. And number two, major league pitchers are maybe a little more predictable than minor league pitchers, and perhaps that works out in, in some ways. I don't want to say predictable and that they're easier to hit, but um, you can depend on certain uh, certain things being, uh, or certain pitches being in certain spots and not being uh, oh, wild all over the place like you might see in the minors. I don't know if there's any of that that's contributing to to his fantastic start, but he's making the Pirates think about, I'm sure, allotting playing time, and when Starling Marte comes back, maybe they find a way to keep Meadows around. He's an interesting prospect because a lot of hype when he was drafted, eighth overall in 2013, thought to be the successor to Andrew McCutcheon in center field. Kutch is gone, but he's had some injury problems, and and like I said, the power not showing up in AAA. So he's almost a post-hype prospect a little bit, but that could be working in his favor too because the expectations weren't there like they were for when, say, Gregory Polanco was called up four years ago. Yeah, and I think the fact that he wasn't killing the ball in AAA when he came up yeah. sort of dampened expectations too. I don't think. I mean, I was, I was actively trying to dampen some expectations when he got called up. But you know, he got called up because the Pirates needed a center fielder, not because he he was playing at a level that demanded he be called up. And uh, but he's taken you know serious advantage of the opportunity. I do think that especially. As soon as Marte comes back, that oblique injury is something that's been known to nag. So I, I think it would probably be smart to kind of work him in mm-hmm. slowly at the beginning. And then that gives them a little bit more of a sample to see Meadows. And it also gives Gregory Polanco some time to get his batting average out of the basement. I mean, not that that should be the thing that we're focusing on, but... Um, yeah, it's not a good look uh, when it's 220-something uh, at this point of the year, and there's a kid hitting 400 um, <laughs> who's coming off the bench. And so, yeah, I think it gives them some time. But I think in the long run, if they aren't able to find a role for him, it's not like there aren't things that he can still learn in AAA. I, mean, I think if you look at a 760-something OPS so far this season, there's certainly some things that could be mastered uh, at a lower level if there isn't regular playing time for him in the majors. Let's talk Polanco before we sign off for the day. Uh, Jared Wickerham, our, our good friend and loyal listener, asked what's wrong with Gregory Polanco. I looked into some of the peripheral behind-the-scenes numbers yesterday because, yeah, the batting average is down. The walk rate is way up. That's a positive. He's not chasing out of the strike zone like he used to. That's a career low. But he's also making contact less frequently than he ever has in his major league career. In the zone, out of the zone, it doesn't matter. And fastballs have particularly given him a lot of trouble. If you look at some of the the pitch weight metrics that are out there, four seamers have gotten by him. He's been well below average on that. So Clint Hurdle talks about the longer swing coming into play. That's Polanco's swing flaw is that he gets too uh, too arm centric with it? Isn't isn't quick to it with with the hips and delivering everything at once? Is that what you see there? And and are you starting to think maybe he'll never be able to fix it? Maybe that's just something that he'll have to uh, grind through for his entire career. Maybe it'll end up limiting his career to a certain degree. Um, because it's year four now, and you feel like he should have been able to generate some sort of a fix. For that at this point yeah the thing is is that we've seen stretches of him absolutely kill the ball we saw one at the beginning of this year that's why when you look at his season numbers they're not i mean if, especially if you look at the the more advanced like ops and, and wrc plus and things like that yeah, his power is up yeah his power's his, his way power's up, been up. Mm-hmm. this stretch he's been on for the last week or two where you see fastball down the middle hitters count yeah. and he's fouling it off and he's popping it up. I think that is the sign of just a hitter that's in a really bad place with a swing right now. I I don't necessarily think that it's a problem that can't be overcome because he's done it. He's done it in short stretches. I think the issue is he's never had a consistent swing where he's able to do something and then stay with it for weeks and months. He seems to always fall back into bad habits. Yeah. He seems to, 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 I don't know whether it's a 
I don't know whether it's a mindset thing. I don't know if it's a a muscle memory thing, but it just seems like he's unable to keep himself in that good place for a long time. And in the past, it's been injuries where he's he's gotten in a good place and then he pulls his hamstring and then his whole mechanics fall apart. Shoulder's been an issue too. Yeah, his shoulder's been a long term yeah. issue for him. Um, it seems like he's healthy this year. Um, he missed one game because he fouled a ball off his foot. I think other than that, he's been healthy the whole season. So that kind of, you know, not to say excuse, but that sort of re- line of reasoning is out the window this time. So I don't know. I think it's it's tough to say it's going to limit his career when he's done it, but he's got to figure out – he's either got to figure out a way to get back into that, that good spot more often, more regularly, or he's got to come up with some kind of happy medium where it's not – hot and cold and, and can kind of be halfway uh, because I think halfway between where he was, say, the first three weeks of the season and where he is right now is still a really good hitter. He doesn't have to hit the ball. I mean, if he hits the ball like he did the first three weeks of the season, he's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> he doesn't have to be that good to be a very productive regular outfielder for the Pirates, but he's got to get somewhere in between where he was then and where he is now. And I wonder how much to pin on the player because, you know, the Pirates have probably identified this. If Hurdle's talking about it openly, it's not something they're hiding here. That The swing gets long. Jeff Branson, the hitting coach. Jeff Livesey, the assistant hitting coach. I'm sure they've worked on drills with them. So it's difficult to say, well, the hitting coach stinks because he can't fix Polanco. Maybe Polanco needs to help himself in that way, too. Uh, it, it's a two-way street, is what I'm saying, when it comes to mechanical glitches and figuring things out. Because the player ultimately has to put it into play on the field in game situations. And you hear about it in all sports. You hear about it in golf a lot, too, which I think is comparable in this way. My range swing is different from my, my, my match swing because pressure and because of the, the desire to perform. We all fall into bad habits under pressure, I think, at times. Yeah, I think in general in baseball, um, the effects of coaching are much more seen at a strategic level than a tactical level. So I think okay. if, if you want to talk about – uh, our focus as a baseball team, if, if I'm a coach, I'm going to say you know, our focus as a baseball team is uh, we want to have good fastball command. We want to uh, play an aggressively shifting defense uh, that's going to turn a lot of uh, ground balls into outs. Uh, we want to be very aggressive on the base paths so that uh, we, we force other teams to make us get outs. We, we take advantage of extra bases when they're there. I think those strategic things play a lot more than – Tactical things like, uh, you know, here's how I want you to throw this slider, or yeah, like it, technique things. It, you mean? I mean, yeah. the, some we we make a big deal about those things when they happen mm-hmm. because there's this big noticeable change. And sure, you know, um, somebody teaching somebody a new way to do something is interesting, and, and it's certainly a part of coaching. But I don't think I think we give too much credit uh, when a coach help somebody in that way and probably blame them too much when they're unable to help someone that way because I think the the important thing about coaching is those big picture ideas and that's where I mean that's where you see like if we talk about the difference between managers and wins and losses like a lot of it is just how soon they go to the bullpen you know like the way they put their lineup in place and and those things don't have anything to do with Gregory Polanco's swing. The, mm-hmm. Gregory Polanco's swing is, at the end of the day, Gregory Polanco's responsibility. And if he was hitting 300, nobody would be trying to tell him to do anything differently. Yeah, but he's not right now. He's arguably the most disappointing pirate. Maybe Tyon's up there for me, too. They're, they're neck and neck in that way. Okay, I'm going to ask you to make two predictions before we sign off for the day. Um, Uh-oh. Ten-game stretch starting tonight for the Pirates. Three against St. Louis at home, three against the Cubs at home, four at St. Louis. How many of those do you think they win, considering where they are right now and how they've been streaky all year? It wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility for you to say seven or eight, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree. (laughs) Yeah, I'll say uh, six and four. Okay, six and four would be, I think, a good result. I think that's that's a pretty positive outcome from, from that. And I feel like... That's reasonable um, mm-hmm. because I don't feel like they've been playing their best baseball this last week or so, uh, and they have been they've shown the ability to kind of turn it around pretty quickly. Yeah. And the other thing is, none of those teams are playing. I mean, yeah, you look at them and like those are upper echelon teams in Major League Baseball, but winning you, teams, yeah, winning teams. But you look right at now. the records. I mean, they're playing essentially the same baseball to this point mm-hmm. as the Pirates. Yeah. They're all within a half a game, a game of each other. Yeah. So, I think it's. 
Yeah, I mean, there's been this narrative, oh, the Pirates are beating up on the bad. Those teams are beating up on bad teams, too. That's how they got to where the (laughs) Pirates are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't look at the Cubs or the Cardinals and see Giants to be slayed. I see Peers. Um, And so... A little bit better than 500 against those teams, I think it would be a very good series. I think they'll go 5-5. Five and five. I'll put it that way. And I said Vegas in 7. What do you think is going to happen in the cup final in two weeks? What are we talking about? Mm, I'll say uh, I actually agree with you at Vegas in 7. But to be different, I'll say Vegas in 6. <laughs> 6. They'll get it done six. in Washington. <laughs> One last uh, Everybody conquest. Everybody seems to win the cup the first time on the road, too. That seems to be very... It seems to happen more often than the alternative. I know yeah. that. I don't know yeah. if that's actually accurate off the look back, but... For the Penguins, seemed, they've never won it at home. It but. certainly seems that way in my head, that the, especially the first time somebody wins. It very rarely happens at home. I don't know. Mm. I don't know if that's true or not, but... <laughs> I'll have to do some research. It's up to you to go back and... Tell me I'm wrong and, later on Twitter, as you <laughs> usually do. <laughs> what is Twitter for besides to tell people that they're wrong? Well, thank you for listening to and watching The River's Edge. This is Geik's Got Game. This has been Geik's Got Game. I'll be back in studio next Friday, and we'll have a couple of games down in the Cup Final. We'll see how the Pirates are doing in this, what seems to be an early critical stretch if they want to stay in contention. He's Alan Saunders. You can find him on Twitter, a Saunders underscore PGH. He's on Pirates Prospects. He's on Pittsburgh Sports Now, the uh, brother site of Pittsburgh Hockey Now, which I co-own. Again, this is Matt Geica reminding you that when the radio fades, you know life's moving fast. God bless you. Have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you next week.